Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Unicus Radio Hour. I am your host, Robert Stanley. We're we're going to have a wild ride tonight. I can just feel it in the air. <laughs> I hope you I hope you buckled up and ready for this one. Uh, my special guest tonight is Grandfather Peter Coyote, and uh, he's written a book, a most unusual book, called The Atomic Bum. And uh, you know the old adage, you should never judge a book by its cover? Well, it's especially true with this particular book. Um, I find it was a lot like reading uh, a modern-day Mark Twain, actually. Um, <laughs> Man, I think people uh, are going to absolutely uh, flip out when they hear some of this information. So, I don't know how to, I really don't know how to introduce Grandpa Coyote properly. I think he's just going to have to tell us for straight, you're going to have to get it straight from his mouth. So, without further ado, I am going to bring him on the air. Grandpa Coyote, are you there? Yeah, I sure am. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> hey, my pleasure. I got to tell you, that is such an a really eye-opening book that you've written, the atomic the atomic bum. Yeah. Um, how did you come up with that title? I don't rightly know. I can tell you kind of indirectly what it means. Uh, the atomic bum, even though it sounds like the atomic bum, which I mean bomb, which bomb. is an explosion, you know, right. it disintegrates everything. Uh, the atomic bum is means a hobo with Adam type origins, you know. The original um, man, Adam, but you call him Adam. A T A T O M, just like the tiny little proton and neutron <laughs> spinning around each sure. other. That's sure. that's the person that I'm talking about in hum- terms of human history. Right. Uh, that would be the person that the bum would be. <laughs> 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 and, and if I understood it correctly, you're, this character, this so-called atomic bomb, uh-huh. was one of the original created beings who then in turn dreams, he and his counterpart, Adam and Eve, dream up the first physical reality as we know it. And that's so, I guess you could say he is the... Uh, creator of what we call the atomic structure, even though he he sees it as um, a construct or a dream that that he and his counterpart are having. Yes. So I got that part right, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's basically it. So the atomic bum, good dude. Uh-huh. He's the he's the good dude in the origin, but he's also all of us. Mm. So it's not like uh, he's anything special or unique because. Each person that comes, it's just like an atom expanding into matter and creating things from essential thought, from the movement of love. Mm. It's just like that, the expansion into humanity. It's just like that. So this dude is like all of us, mm. including including Eva, as I prefer to call her, you know, the, okay. the, which... Uh, you know, uh, there's some there's some origins that, uh, you know, in those old legends, and, uh, biblical and otherwise, uh, there are some essential truths kind of buried down beneath those beneath those stories. You know, it's just mm-hmm. like all life. There's there's much more to it than than the visible eye can see. So you have to practice a little discernment or whatever you want to call it, intuition, spiritual function. Well, yeah, I mean, I, look, so a lot of the information that you put in there is extremely down to earth, but every once in a while, the, you know, your, the character, which, you know, you wrote it as a biography of someone, and he's he's offering up information that I'm not sure how he could have known this, actually, but it's, it, regardless, it's it's just fascinating, you know, I mean, so you talk about the separation of um, some of the originally created beings were human and others were reptilian. You want to you want to explain that to the audience? Well, um, you kind of got to see this as a great big playground, right? Earth, you right. Know? And you kind of got to see the players in it as essentially babies, because we mm-hmm. we we've, we've dumbed ourselves down to that point. It's the only way we could live it. Mm-hmm. So, essentially, that's what we are, and that's where we didn't necessarily begin. In the beginning, we were. 
you know, far more intelligence. But the uh, the uh, I've seen a time. I don't think it's in the book where life stepped forward from the sea, mm-hmm. and there were two forms of it, and one of them was kind of human, and one of them was kind of reptilian. Mm-hmm. It was in this time I would call the reformation when. You know, the reptilian life gave way to the human form because the reptilian life uh, had gotten completely out of hand and couldn't control itself. It got kind of lost in the playground Mm -hmm. and uh, really sunk to some new lows. And so they were discorporated in in their larger physical form. They were allowed to keep their format and come back in a much smaller way, and they weren't any too happy about it. But humans, which had formerly been kind of created as their food, uh, as a part of this game they were playing, Mm -hmm. uh, they uh, agreed to become occupied by essential souls of the universe who could then come and subject themselves to all of the reptilian influences. Uh, all the things that the reptilians have been dealing with take actually as a part of that take actually an occupant in at least one occupant inside of yourself that is reptilian in nature so you know the nature and character of it very well we humans call that side of ourselves ego Mm. but as you become more conscious you begin to notice its reptilian nature Mm. (laughs) it just is Mm -hmm. so Essentially, we began as, I mean, I'm trying to tell the whole thing in a nutshell in 33 seconds, but That's essentially right. we began we began as, as very intelligent and highly creative beings and gradually uh, came into this place where, you know, we, because we kind of had to train ourselves into it, so we spent a lot mm-hmm. of time in these enlightened ways and getting used to the body and enjoying it, and then it took on a... There was a change, and it took on a much denser form, and we had to recondition ourselves from that. Mm-hmm. At some point after that, then there was this agreed-upon invasion. It came in pretty horrible ways, but uh, that's when the reptilians come to be our uh, our fellow occupants of our little carcasses here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, like I say, you know, it, it you boy, it goes from just completely normal uh, descriptions and conversations to some just amazing things about angels and demons and and the interplay that goes yeah. on and and how yeah. we how we remain relatively ignorant to these things and yet we're caught right in the middle of the whole damn thing. Yeah, it's the invisible surface. But see, the reason why it's a good time now for the atomic bomb to go off is because. <laughs> We're essentially in that age now where right. people are, despite themselves, becoming uh, more conscious of that so-called other world that operates just beyond what we see as the visible world. Right, right. So more and more people are beginning to experience that, and they need a little coaching because they essentially want to see it as all, you know, bad, bad baby talk and beautiful love and nursing on mama's nipple, and that. <clears throat> That's a part of it, but that's not where it ends. You know that. Sure. It, it's much <laughs> more involved than that. <laughs> right, 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 right. But you know, you're, the, this atomic bomb that you write about, um, his life was very difficult at times and extremely beautiful at times. I think it's a microcosm of life here on this planet, and. Um, you know, at first I was a little shocked by some of the graphic nature of the the way you're describing the the sexuality uh, yeah. of of various family members within this person's family and even his own sexuality. But then I realized, you know what? That's really how we are. You you know, and again, that's why it reminded me of good old Samuel Clemens. People know him as Mark Twain. He was really, you know, a lot of people found him very offensive because he was so honest. He was so oh, I- brutally honest. I'm about, a great admirer of the man at the very least. I agree. Yeah, with, sure. I, lo- I, love, I loved his form and format. And yep. For his time, he was awesome, yeah. Oh, yeah, very much ahead of his to time be, because he was so p- politically incorrect in telling it out yeah. exactly like it was or is. Oh, can you imagine him in California in the mining camps? Oh, my oh, goodness. Oh. Yeah. But that that must have been a life. I mean, to even be compared to him is, is greatly humbling, and I appreciate your remarks, but... Yeah, I'm 
I'm just telling the story. Yeah, but it's it's also the American story. I, I know it's this. You're, you've also encapsulated the the history of mankind, and yeah. or, or and a little bit of the hidden history of the peeking behind the curtain, as it were. But because at, you know you're writing about America and in America, and yeah. it, with I mean all the you know good, bad, and the ugly of <laughs> America, and specifically the Mormon Church. Yeah, that blew my mind. Okay, I mean I'm. I don't belong to a church, but I could really, really vicariously sense what it must have been like for that person uh, growing up in a Mormon family and having all these, um, oh, God, a, a strict belief structure and a, a, a lot of uh, do's and don'ts and, and ex, just expectations that are put upon that, that individual in a family like that. And and the, the, the really amazing part that I, I could totally relate to, because... Okay, even though I don't belong to a religion uh, per se, I, ha- I have a deep abiding love for God, uh, but it's not based on religion. And here's why: when I was born, my father was a minister at, at a something called Self Realization Fellowship that was started by a man from India named Paramahansa Yogananda. Uh-huh. And I think I'm going to really upset some people when I say this, but that's not my intention. Okay, I just want I want it to be known. This is this is the actual truth about that organization. It's a fellowship, yes. But a lot of people think that, that um, taking a vow of celibacy is somehow a good or normal thing to do when you enter a church. But it's yeah. completely abnormal as a human being to have that kind of everyday um, you know, intimacy with uh, people and never have any sexual feelings or let alone act on those feelings. <laughs> so... So, there's a lot of hypocrisy. We've seen it in pretty much every church. There's always a lot of lying going on to the public about, you know, we're we're celibate. We're all, you know, we're just waiting until we get married to have kids, and you know, this is the vow we took and all stuff. Nothing could be further from the truth. Okay, and I'm not going to give out details other than to say that it's it's pretty much common knowledge amongst the people uh, who who devote themselves to that. Uh, church or fellowship that Paramahansa himself actually had a, a child out of wedlock, and most of the nuns and the and the you know the monks were actually getting it on, and you know there was a lot of gay sex going on, and I mean it was just uh, nothing like what they portrayed themselves to be publicly, and so when I've read the account of the atomic bomb, the old good dude talking about <laughs> the Mormon. Church, sorry, it's not funny, folks. It's but it it, it did make me chuckle because I'm like, okay, I've seen this before. Yeah, this makes perfectly good sense. And yeah, <laughs> it's not like you've got the photographic evidence there to prove it. But I know human nature. I've seen this. It just it happens again and again and again. You repress something like that or try to suppress something like that, and it actually makes it worse. Yeah, that's when it gets warped. That's when it. Oh, and you can't imagine. The world of Utah in the 1950s, when I was just a tiny child, uh-huh. it was weird. <laughs> well, I've only been, <laughs> Peter Coyote. I have only been there once in my lifetime as a young man, and uh-huh. I what really flipped me out. Okay, the first place I stopped was Lehman Caves, and yeah. you must you know how that thing goes on forever. That's awesome. That's it is. Huge, it's yeah. it's humongous, and. And yet, from what I understand, there's a lot of things like that within that mountain range or that the flats out there, the salt flats. There's all yeah. kinds of things like that that no human is ever going to see. Um, yeah. But, okay, so after that was my introduction to Utah. And wow. I thought, oh, this place is incredible. And then, but as we <laughs> as we get closer to Salt Lake City, we stop for gas. And I'm, ah, oh, man, this one guy had a hat on, okay? Yeah. And, and I and I thought, man, that's a pretty big hat he's wearing. He takes the hat off, and he looked like, well, the movie The Coneheads hadn't come out yet, but that's what he looked like. His head, his head, his whole head was in, really enormous, and I, I mean, going straight up. And I'm looking, and like, and then I'm starting to look around, and I'm seeing all these other people that have like weird de- defects and stuff. And then my the people I was traveling with, they're like, yeah, these folks interbred too much. And I'm like, oh my god, what 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 could, could have possibly possessed them to do that? So that was my introduction to Utah. Oh, that's one thing I didn't even mention in the book, but there are, there are many genetic anomalies there amongst the humans that you don't see anywhere else. No. 
I attribute a lot of that, though, to the 1950s atomic bomb testing uh, yeah. in Nevada when they used yeah. to let that atomic dust come right over. Oh, yeah. Because they wanted to see the effect on a larger population. We were the this nearest one. We were ideally downrange from it at just mm-hmm. the right amount, you know. That's true. That's true. And but I think that has a, that's a big factor, too. But the other factor is, that. yeah, the spirit that goes with that particular uh, cult or religion or whatever you want to call it. Uh, because there is an energy, you know, and it's a very, um, God forgive me, guys, I, I, I love my friends in the Mormon church mm-hmm. and my family as well, because there's many of them, you know, I don't belong mm-hmm. to the church myself, I'm I'm a ordained minister and I believe in the, the, the Spirit Wind Church, which basically is life itself and just love and being here, you know right. what I mean? Yeah. So you worship in your heart and your place of worship is the sky and earth, I mean, that's your cathedral, that's Real simple. Right. So that, that's my essential core of my being. That's what I am mm-hmm. in essence. And that's what I try to live to as human with my frailties and everything. And consider my background, I'm doing pretty damn good. <laughs> you can't imagine the pressures in a place like that on a child that's essentially a free spirit. At first, you're 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 worthy of it. And you're just looking around going, oh, my goodness, you know. I mean, mm-hmm. you're tiny, so you really can't think about it in these terms. But you just see... Oh, the heaviness of it—you can't imagine. It just—it would just take your breath away if you could feel it. Right. But but then you you know and then, I mean the facade comes off in a big way mm. when this kid's only four years old. I mean, good grief! Who amongst us can handle that? Not many. But because this guy could step beyond, even as a child, he could step beyond the essential visible world, he was able to deal with it because he could back out of his body and still be in it right. and be talking to the angels and seeing what's really going on around him and kind of understanding it in a deeper way and seeing that even this, as horrible as it is, is a created illusion. But at four years old, you know, you don't have those kind of thinking capabilities. Well, so well, it just... Just I becomes think, a numbness, you know. Sure, and I, I think we need to let the audience. Know. I don't want to give away the entire book, but um, I kind of th- that's what we're here to discuss. So, yeah, what, what you're talking about the the character in your book, yeah, this individual uh, witnessed or participated um, indirectly in a ritual murder. Is that m- my understanding? Yeah. And what is that? It takes place. It takes place on many different levels and as this okay. child gets older and begins to deal with this energy that's right. totally driven him nuts mm-hmm. through it i mean you know i mean you can't imagine the emotional swings the poor guy went through i mean mm. he has my deepest sympathies mm-hmm. but also my greatest admiration because that took a lot of uh, uh grit to get through the, just to stay alive and breathe and live day to day like that you can't imagine Right. So, you know, I can really appreciate it. But, um, man, when that darkness slams, it slams. And, it, you know, it be, it, it, this is where what was already kind of like a deep curiosity and beginning to be a little bit of rage, because I had real honest eyes, as the kid did. I mean, I, I'm talking about my alter ego here, I reckon. But anyway, uh, the kid had real honest eyes. Mm-hmm. And he had an essential, honest heart and an honest mouth once he understood what words were and how to use them. And essential truth would come out of him. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I'm talking before the little ritual thing happened. Mm-hmm. And it deeply offended and hurt people because they weren't used to the truth. In, in many cases, not every, but just about all of them. <laughs> mm-hmm. So this was already kind of a, you know, he was already feeling very suppressed. You know, because he couldn't be himself. He couldn't be honest. You know, he couldn't. I mean, he didn't have the words for it, but that was the feeling of it. Sure, sure. You and the, the community doesn't support that. There's a there yeah. is a rule within. Again, a lot of this was new to me, even though I've read the, the Book of Mormon and kind of studied a little bit about Mormonism. It, yeah. I, I, I never would have known unless I read your book, The Atomic Bomb, which is, by the way, available on Amazon.com oh, for anybody yeah. who's interested. Um, the, the, I, I just didn't know that there was so much uh, enforced secrecy within the group. Uh, oh yeah, it has it has a traditional roots right to its beginning. You know that mm-hmm, was mm-hmm. there was always 
And in, let's, let's preface this by saying this. this. This happens in most every religion. Some just worse sure. than others because right. those are, are a carrier of, of different energies than others. Others right. are just there to help people contain themselves. So on. But yeah, they go, they go um, deeply dark real quick. But the secret side of it, I mean, the regular members practice great secrecy. They get a name they can't even mention to their partner in the temple, things like that. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. Secrets that just only you can have, you know. Uh, but then beneath that is another level, just like in the government, just like, you know, in every high society kind of organization in the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's the shadow side. There's, the, there's right. what the energy that's really operating through it that nobody wants to pay attention to. Right. But there it is. And this is when it became visible to this little kid. Innocent little kid, relatively, and it just it it just took his head off mm. and covered up his heart, and then he became occupied mm-hmm. by uh, a much stronger reptilian energy than most people could endure, you know. Mm-hmm. And he took it in him in himself as a form of rage, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, so he's lived with that for a mighty long time now. But that rage, you know, took all that he was seeing. Uh, in truth and honesty and th- and expressing through love and curiosity took all of that and turned it into this judgmental thing, you know? Mm-hmm. And began to feel separate and alone from everybody and, and, and uh, began to act out this compulsive behavior where the child had been pretty normal before that. Began to act out compulsively and sometimes violent behavior, you know? Mm-hmm. And just just on an impulse, a whim would come, and the poor kid could not stop himself. It just went. It just mm. happened. And uh, you know, he had no understanding of this. You know, it just it, he began to try and deal with it and contain it because it got him in a lot of trouble. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. As you could imagine, but it was this was the way this energy had to flow. You know, because mm-hmm. the real deal that he'd taken on was an occupant that was meant to ultimately uh, he would sacrifice his his life to his soul to and that occupant would be the being in charge and would go and assume some position in some secret way that would make it very influential in this world that was the intention I see. and it's my humble opinion that many of the so-called elite that you see now that are you know, seem to have all these plans to, you know, off two-thirds, three-fourths of the Earth's population and Mm -hmm. enslave the rest, you know. uh, People that could even think that way, obviously, are pretty far from their human heart. This this is what's happened to them in one form or another. It may not be exactly the same thing, because my feeling is it takes different forms in different organizations, but there's always some sacrifice to it. You know, mm-hmm. there's always this uh, resulting. I mean, the people that have, that are um, that operate these rituals and so forth are completely outside themselves. There's a, another energy in charge. It's been electronically and hypnotically implanted in them. There's no. I mean, they've agreed to it in some spiritual level, maybe long before it happened. But mm-hmm. there's no real. They're they're just motor reflex in motion. They're their hearts are absent, you know. Right, they're not in the driver's seat anymore. I know what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Not a good thing. So now, about the Mormon philosophy of this being, are we in the final days? Is that why they are always uh, storing up the food and going yeah. underground yeah, and all that? Yeah, that's, that's all we heard about when we was little kids. And in a way, right. that, that rage and part of me secretly loved it, the idea of the atomic bomb. Mm. Bomb, because that would like you know uh, take care of the problem in a pretty dramatic way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, in his little child innocent eyes, you know, he filtered by rage. That's what he could see, you know. And to him, it didn't seem so bad. It seemed terrible, but at the same time, it didn't. And the strangest thing was, I don't know if this is in the book, but the kid um, felt familiar with the atomic blast. When he'd see pictures of it in the movies and stuff, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he knew the sound and the feel of it already. Mm. There was some attachment there. Well, you know, 
that he but, was conscious of, but he didn't think of it in terms of past lives or anything because he's just a kid. <laughs> right, right. But the entity that was had become part of his life was probably one of the legion of entities that had influenced mankind to do this kind of create this sort of destructive tool. Yeah. Uh, because they're the ones, like you said, they're they're behind all pretty much all the negative emotions and deeds that occur on this yeah. world. Yeah, the Illuminati are a bunch of unconscious human beings. They're like walking cadavers that are just being yeah. operated through by these other energies. Right, 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 right. And, and, and they don't get to have any fun. I mean, you know, it's no. really sad. <laughs> that's true, that's true. But it was still, on some level, like you say, that was a choice, I think, that they made to, because their ego got caught up in the whole trip of like, oh, we'll make you powerful. We'll make you yeah. rich, you know, yeah. and all that that nonsense. So they got sucked into it. They agree. Well, you know why they so keep wanting more because they can't feel it. They yeah, know, that's they right. Wait for something they can feel. Mm. <laughs> it's you talk about hell. Yeah. Here it is, guys that have everything can push a button and kill anybody in the world mm. and, and masses of population if they think they want to. You know, guys like that, and and mm. they can't. They're not happy. They always right. feel alone. They always feel isolated and empty. Yeah. And they just can't get enough. They got every luxury and they got nothing. That's yeah. hell, baby. It is. That, could... that that's worse than being in the ghetto and being the poorest person on earth. You know what right. I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. I I used to call them. They got a hole in their soul. But then later, as I grew up, I realized, man, some of these people don't even have a soul anymore. They've they have so yeah. turned away from the light and the love yeah. that is our our Creator God of this universe. Yeah. That uh, they they've <laughs> they've so fall so fallen so far out of the into the darkness that they simply do not exist as a soul any longer. They're sort of yeah. a shell. There's just they're yeah. they're all they are is this, this sort of like you said like Walking Dead uh, uh, physical body. Um, yeah. Trying to find some sort of energy that can replicate the light and nothing can. Nothing can do. <laughs> nothing can take the place of of the light. That is the the father creator of this this particular universe, and um, that's why I was really blown away when I was reading about your description of uh, the you know the char- this atomic bomb, the way he was having some sort of intuitive psychic knowledge about Joseph Smith, the guy that uh, the original founder of the the Mormon Church, and oh, yeah. that he that he he was a radiant glowing being. Now I've never. Read this before. <laughs> I never on read some it. on some levels, yeah. It's yeah, but on ways, yeah. I, yeah, but see, I've often felt like you know, in, again, in religion, you see, artistically anyway, you talk about um, they show us anyway that uh, it's represented as a halo. Yeah. And in literature, they talk about the glory of the Lord or the glory of an angel. What they're talking about is the radiant light that yeah. is emitted by that being. Yeah. And the only beings that I know that can do that are those entities that are truly tapped into the source of all creativity within this this universe. Yeah, and they, they keep coming around and, and and visiting us in different ways and sometimes they're mm-hmm. pretty warped, you know. They're not sure. all they're not all coming as saints wrapped in purple robes, man. Let me tell you. <laughs> right. Well there's different ways to convey energies, you know what sure. I mean? And sure. so these light beings keep coming back into this life as human beings mm. uh, in very different forms and not in ways you always recognize, which is probably good because then they can get away with a whole lot more uh, energy work than they can otherwise. Once once you're visible, it makes it a little tougher to get away and do things that you know you know how to do. <laughs> right, right. So now a you know, very controversial aspect to this whole story of uh, autobiography or excuse me biography of this individual um he was reporting that the <laughs> Joseph Smith apparently was quite a drinker and a womanizer and it and I guess he sort of upset a bunch of people and that may have been one, one of the reason he was killed yeah do you do you did you feel that that was accurate well yeah I do I mean you know um Directly tapped into that life when those segments were given me by my great great grandmother because she's the one that lived it. So, oh. but she knew this man intimately, and so she's the one that that uh, channeled the, his essential life story to me. And oh, I, was, okay. I would I guess channel may not be the right word, but no. conveyed is probably a better because it just came to me as conscious memory and I just wrote about it. Uh huh. 
you know, and uh, it's a life I'm very familiar with in my own way. I'm not saying I was ever having anything to do with that life. Mm -hmm. I mean, as far as being that person, uh, but I'm just, it's a life that I'm familiar with on, in the mystical way, in, in the mystical realms. It's one that I can, uh, I just have some familiarity with. So it's one I know in, in intimate detail because of that. Between that and what uh, great grandma conveyed me, then I was able to write somewhat authoritatively about it but you got to understand it's in a mystical way so it doesn't pretend to be a historical representation even though that's the way it's written understood it's the irony you know? <laughs> 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 and now if you think about it anybody you've known a male figure who has been a six, quote quote successful preacher yeah. has been what a womanizer and a drinker. That's it's a yeah. it's a it's a, a qualification they have to meet Pretty in much. order to obtain such a position. <laughs> yeah. So he wasn't too much out of line or out of character for a man in his day. You just couldn't do that openly and visibly, right. and affect as many lives as this. You got to understand. He laid his hands in the early days in those temples. He laid his hands on nearly every woman that walked through the door of his secret little temples. Mm. And they were sworn to secrecy and couldn't talk about it outside of that. And for a lot of them, it was a new and exciting experience because they, they hadn't known there was anything more than, you know, animal-type breeding. Right. <laughs> there were some pretty caveman attitudes back then, you know. So. Sure. Uh, this guy was quite the liberator in that way, especially in a way... I mean, in a dark sort of way. Yeah. He came from the light. But you said women but, remember that they were love and not not cattle. You know? Wow. Something along those lines. Because you got to understand that was the real level of the Mormon Church. That was its purpose back then. And you know, even in my book, I kind of disguise it. But to be quite honest with you, that was what it was there for. It was liberating the energies of the mother, which until that time had been so suppressed, she was almost ready to go away again and not come back, huh. which would have been horrible. So anyway, it's, I'm glad she stuck around. And this guy was able to help in his way. And of course, there was, anytime there's something like that going on in one place, it's going on all over the world in different yeah. ways. Because yeah, there's probably yeah. a dozen or so that are doing it. You know? Sure, sure. So these but, movements tend to go together, and, and each one can, has a little part of the energy. And, of course, people get all caught up with it and say it's the only way and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But, you know, that's for them, that's what they need, that's what they get. But the ones that are, you know, kind of bright, they carry the energy forward, give it to the next generation. And, you know, it gets expands. Love expands. And, you know, we've been in a great contraction we call the Dark Ages. Mm-hmm. And, and we're basically just barely coming out of those now. We're just right on the cusp of of beginning that, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what planetary ascension is. It's just basically remembering who we are. And that's mm -hmm. the atomic explosion. That's the awareness the, the atomic bum creates in his own essential way mm -hmm. and in another way, as sweet as it is. Um, mm -hmm. Because he could dream into being what he saw there at that gateway because he could do that experience that in a real sort of way mm -hmm. it essentially has already happened and so that atomic explosion is going off and its effects are rippling throughout the planet and the universe beyond Earth. And there you just wouldn't believe how many beings and energies of different natures and ways are here with us, both mm -hmm. energetically, physically, and multidimensionally. They're, they've come from all over this universe and many others because mm -hmm. this is the essential mother, hmm. this earth, you know, uh, and we're her baby's baby, and she's she's allowed us to be that, mm -hmm. you know, and she's treated us right considering how things have gone here. But you've got to remember, too, that in another way, it's uh, not happening because we've already kind of undone it. How so? Well, when you go through this gateway, you go back to the beginning of time and you undo the anomaly. Oh. And so then the effect ripples right through back through time because time is more like straight up and down, not linear. And so uh -huh. it kind of just comes from from the bottom, just like the Big Bang, kind of, just up through 
uh, the generations. I mean, bammo. And here we are still sitting in this one place, this one little segment of time we're in. Mm -hmm. But suddenly we're aware. And it's Mm -hmm. like we've been aware forever. So the shock of going from, you know, relatively dark state, the dark ages, the dark person, Mm -hmm. darkly inhabited beings, rather than the shock of having that change, you know, dramatically and all at once, it does. Mm -hmm. But because it goes back to the beginning of time to do that beginning, to, to change that anomaly, then when it comes back to us here, in this time frame, because it comes rather quickly, because there is no time. It just, boom, it's there. Because all experience is kind of simultaneous. I know it's weird. Mm. And it's way out there. But that's how it works. You know, it's mul- it's multidimensional. It's more like each life is stacked simultaneously on the next one, each one that you live and everyone else, because, you know, there's, there's threads. Souls make threads through life. Mm. That's why they call it the tapestry of life, because it's like it's greatly interwoven. Mm-hmm. You know, and each person is a part of that that tapestry, weaving itself through all these lives, which are kind of stacked one on top of another. Mm -hmm. So they're happening simultaneously. That's why there's familiarity when you know, and a lot of deja vu because you have lived this stuff before because you're doing it in each lifetime that you live. Mm -hmm. So if you go back to the beginning, which is at the bottom of the pile there, and change the little anomaly, that energy just floats right up through it. You know, and consciousness has always been and has never been taken away. Hmm. And so then you're you're in a conscious state, and we can finish the planetary ascension, you know, with a whole lot less complications. And the indications that this is true in the world are yeah. what most everybody is feeling these days. First is the restlessness, then the uneasiness, the feeling that, oh my God, I'm doomed, you know. Mm. But there's also along with that a conscious awareness of the world living beyond this one. And you know, when mm. you get mm-hmm. glimpses, you get you get it, what they call epiphanies, openings, yeah. awakenings. And people are getting more of this every day, and I don't care where they are, if it's the garbage man or the president, you know. Mm-hmm. There's no escape in it. It's collective consciousness revealing itself once again. You know, I I got to interject something here. So you're telling me this, what I'm seeing in my mind. I think you're describing what some people call the Akashic record, and and uh, it's collectively all of us. It's our our consciousness combined, uh, yeah. evolving. God. Now, right, but but specifically the record of God's presence here on this world and all of our um, all of our deeds and misdeeds here. Now, what you're describing though too about how this sort of uh, it's a fix. I mean, okay, here's what I see is a computer working in computers. Sometimes let's say you've got a document, right? And then you you find that, that there's an error in the document. So you you create you, you you repair the document and then you go to save it and it says there's an there's already one of these documents existing. Do you want to overwrite it? And if you say yes, the old document is now the new document and everything has just been upgraded or repaired. It's, it's like that. It's sort yeah. of like that. Yeah, it is. It is. That's that's a very good description. I couldn't have said it better myself, man. Well, it's funny because, like I said, it was. I was seeing it real clear in my third eye. You know, just yeah. just that that my mind's eye was really. Some people do that to me. I just. Uh, I, I know it's not like intentional, but I when I'm having a conversation, I'm also seeing like a movie. Um, you know, one of the things I find fascinating about Mormonism is that um, it so openly accepts the uh, reality that uh, people are living on other worlds and that that's something to strive for. Uh, You know, okay, now most religions call it heaven, but you guys, or Mormons in general, uh, I should say, are, they have this, this, uh, it's just like this cosmic awareness, you know, and I I don't, I don't know where that all came from exactly, but it, it, it's interesting. It really intrigues me. Oh, that's part of the essential formula. Like I tell you, you know, these things form around it. And become quite warped, but the essential energy that's planted there yeah. is that that's what you're seeing is that seed that goes along until it can find a place to habituate where it can finally come out and reveal itself, you know, because mm-hmm. essentially we're serving dark masters in all these organizations. Right. But but they're serving the light. So the light has to find its way through. It's kind of just like that change in a way, but it's not, it's a little trickier business, but sure. it, it, it finds its way through. So in any and all of these religions, I don't care how nutty or how beautiful it is, 
uh, they all have these little essential energies that they're carrying forward in some way, even if they're the greatest practitioner of lies, which most of them are, that ever existed. <laughs> you know, there's still that energy. So there can be a lot of genuineness. And that, that that's I think that's what they're carrying through, is that, that aspect that, that feels free enough in churches and so forth to let itself free because it won't do it anywhere else. You know, Monday morning it's kill or be killed. And, you know, F-O, yeah. baby, get out of my way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it's, so it gives them a place to do it. I think that's awesome, you know. Well, yeah, it's, I understand that. But I also see that uh, part of the the cunning of the dark side was to influence us to uh, worship or follow multiple religions and then argue about it. You know, my oh, God's yeah. better than your God. It was just another way of dividing God, and conquering. Shoot us. each other over the moon. How ingenious is that, man? They got us yeah. totally preoccupied, you know. Yes. And then they started, you know, making us in different sizes and shapes and form and colors. Mm-hmm. And God, we even had even more to fight about. <laughs> yeah. Right. Even a nasty little family here, man. We don't like each other too much, you know. Well, but all that can be, uh, you know. Ultimately, I think that that is part of the test here in this classroom. Is once we overcome that impediment that was placed or that obstacle that was placed in front of us yeah. and is testing yeah. us, it, yeah. our resolve, uh, we'll come out of this a much stronger species. Our souls will actually be oh, yeah. much more prepared, better prepared for the the, the real world or the, the excuse me, the, the cosmos itself is, is, <laughs> is yeah. not not like what we have experienced here. This is a very unusual place that we're living in. In my opinion. Yeah, and both well, sure. There's there's not many like it. Mm-mm. One of a kind. So, do you feel that? Um, what I'd like to know. What are your thoughts if Mitt Romney were to become president of the United States? Well, they always said they'd have their men. That the, this was their great legend back in the 1950s that the Constitution would hang by a thread, and one of the Mormon brethren would arise. And and save it, you know. And baby, uh, I mean, you know, for, from a Mormon perspective, I'll bet they're just having orgasms over there in Utah now. If their mm-hmm. if their baby has a chance, you know, because that's their belief, that's their religion. Mm-hmm. And you know, in a way, they have kind of subtly taken over, you know, uh, some of the deeper inside aspects of the government because Mormons are very trusted in those circles and so they've become very big in the organizations like the FBI and the CIA. Is that right? You know, it's because, I'm sorry guys, but they're they're brainwashed so thoroughly mm-hmm. that it makes them more controllable. They can more easy, you know, they're more gullible. They swallow the lie and get all unconscious and self-righteous. Uh-huh. And, you know, they're nice little... Mm, well, I, I can't find a term here that's polite, but okay. robots, a robots, I guess, is about as good as I can. In a way, I mean, it, it's not. I mean, they mean well. They got sincere hearts, but yeah. but they get they they get misled real easily because they swallowed the party line when they were kids, and then they went out and preached it in wicked places of the world, mm-hmm. and they're totally convinced now because they've seen the devil at work in opposition to them, at least in their humble opinion. You know right. I mean? right, 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 right. <laughs> So you know that's in, why they're they're loved in the government, and so they I mean in a way the Mormon Church already has taken over the government. It's 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 one and the same in some wow. ways. You know, well in some ways. Well you know in yeah. my my second book I reported the the hidden history or the connection between the Vatican and Washington D.C. So how do you compare those two? Because both of them have designs to control the entire planet. How can they coexist? Oh, well, they're part of one another. How so? It's, they're part of the same organization, you know. They're just different levels of it, different applications oh. of it. They're, oh. You know, and one always serves the other. And, and, okay. You know, the one is the mother superior, and, and so it gets it gets its jollies first. Okay, so, so you're, so you're sorry, describing... So in the real world, Mormons take a second seat to that, of course. Oh, but they, but they all work... I'm talking about the world of finance and, and power. Yeah. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Political yeah. power, right. yeah. Right, and the church is very wealthy, too, as you... Pointed out in uh, your, you know, the atomic bomb is that Mormon Church uh, is getting ten percent of everybody's w- wages, including people like Glenn Beck, who obviously has made a quite a bit of money in the last decade or so. Oh, he should be a general authority by now. He should be one of the, you know, at least one of the council of the seventy, I think they call it. Because yeah. if a guy, if a guy makes any amount of money like that. 
and he's a churchy kind of guy. Mm-hmm. Oh, they'll elevate him real quick. He all of a sudden became spiritual because he got a lot of money. And of course, they never express it in those terms, you know. But that's the visible. T- I mean, I saw through this stuff when I was a tiny kid. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't want to slander anybody. I and I don't know Mr. Beck personally. Uh, I've heard a little bit of what he's had to say. How he had recovered from uh, drug and alcohol, and and at some point he, you know, religion became a factor. Uh, and so I don't think I don't, I don't know, but I I think he's a stage person. I mean, if that's if that's really him talking on the radio, the dude's, uh, um, in my humble opinion, would yeah. be considered insane. You know. Oh, well, a lot of people say that about him, but yeah. you know, uh, the the bottom line is he's become a force in the media. He went from being just a, a DJ to uh, who was completely drunk and, uh, out of his mind at the time to somehow sobering himself up, pulling himself out of abject poverty. Uh, and and beginning to provide for his family and you know I I don't always agree with the man but at least he outwardly tries to do good for people I mean his yeah. intentions are good okay but the fact that he is a devout Mormon uh, at, or I should say at some point I don't think he was born into it I I, I kind of think that he went to, went into it and and I don't know how far deep he, you know that's the other thing just like the, the Masons people who are on the outer circle. They think it's just a fraternal order, you know, and you, uh, yeah. you know, you're you're there to do good work, and everybody's going to watch everybody's back. Yeah. But on the inner circle, it's a completely different story. Oh, and uh, it has its levels, just like right. uh, any secret organization does, and it does get deeper and, and and more connected to all the other societies. That's what I found yeah. out when I recently they had an open house here, and I went and I yeah. looked at it, and they're like, yeah, and once you become a certain level, third degree. Then you can then you start networking and becoming like a, a Shriner and a and a Knights Templar and a, and so many other things that you could become, uh, you know. And they're all connected. They're all connected. So when you say that about the yeah. Masonic Church, I I kind of heard that too about Joseph Smith that he was somehow involved with the the Masons prior to starting this new religion. Oh, he got dosed by some pretty. Uh bad angels you know he really got whacked when he was a kid but the, you know the dude was a gifted visionary in his own right but mm-hmm. as as does so many of them especially in those days it uh, there's only so much of it you can handle when the when the world around you is of lower consciousness and gradually it will because your flesh just can't take it it will drive you over the edge yeah you know and so then you have trouble, you know, that's when these people become kind of insane. And it's usually towards the end of their journey and, and a lot of times uh, they go away before they can hurt themselves or others. You know what I mean? Get offed. Right, but you know, one way or another, you know, the other similarity I've seen or the common thread I've seen about religion is, and, and I saw it again in uh, your description in your book of, of the early days of the church and the power struggles that were going on and the greed and the the lies and the secrecy and that all that. the whole reason for the organization. It was his family. It wasn't him. He didn't give a hang damn. Yeah. <laughs> right. But then, okay, so here's the point I'm trying to make, though, is once he was out of the way, the organization still was operational and it was gathering momentum. And the yeah. same thing happened on a smaller level to um, – uh, pretty much every uh, well, I'm thinking of the the church my father was a part of. Even after Yogananda passed away, the people who knew him, a lot of them worked in Hollywood, had taken his writings about his life and turned it into this this sort of a. It became not an autobiography, although everybody knows it as the autobiography of a yogi. I know for a fact that was rewritten by professional writers, and they they embellished and they they made him into a larger than life figure. Yeah. And and they sold you know millions of copies of that book and and it became a promotional tool for getting people to come to the church and, and want to know more about how they could become you know uh, re, re, self well they call it self realization for a reason the, yeah. that the corruption of the old uh, all the old mystery schools when you walked in that was the thing above the door was know thyself. Yeah. And and so this this is a process of self realization is not something you do overnight. It can it can take a lifetime or multiple lifetimes. Oh, many, yeah. Okay. So um, anyway, the I I'm not really in a way I wasn't really too surprised by by what I read in your book. But 
on another level I really was because the Mormon church has done such a good job in intimidating people into keeping secrets. And I think that was one of the things you were alluding to about how come uh, certain members of the church would actually fit in really well with the, the organizational structure of other inte- so-called intelligence agencies or secret societies around the world. So yeah, I, can, I can see it fit, the fit there, but um, I just uh, I wonder, you know, the the Brigham Young was was apparently had intentions of taking over America before he before well, you know Joe they, Smith did too. Joe Smith ran for president, and there was there was a plan put in motion before he died huh? uh, to actually overtake. Uh, it's part of the reason they were driven out of Ohio. Uh-huh. Because because he had made some kind of secret war on the, some secret power grab on the U.S. government. I don't remember if it was economic or what. I can't remember the details of the story now, but it is a, it is uh, historical it, that you can find the details. You know when you're when you're looking into that history, boy, you get a lot of wild stuff because the press yeah. was really yellow back then. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. As yeah. vindictive as all get out. So you know, finding truth sometimes can be kind of tricky, but. Sure. Uh, just like it is these days, they wouldn't tell you. They wouldn't tell you a true word if they had to. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but uh, you know, it 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 did. Uh, he did, and and they've that you know, and that's basically why you know the Saints had the great vision to move west because you know, and and Joe Smith you know had that idea too because he could see that the U.S. government was not going to let alone the people around him was not going to leave them alone mm-hmm. to practice their. A so-called religion, you know, until he was in a place that was relatively remote from the U.S. government, where they couldn't right. reach out their long tentacle and grab them. Mm-hmm. So it was basically a war between the Mormon Church and the U.S. government uh, for quite some time, and then they made some kind of peace treaty way back when. And I, my my feeling is, when they ended polygamy, they made mm-hmm. some kind of secret. Now, this is my opinion. They made some kind of secret. Uh, uh, agreement with the U.S. government in the background and uh, changed the way they operate. And it became, because they could do that, then the U.S. government gave them access to things that other organizations might not have. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they kind of, this is the surface part of it, you know, the more or less political part. They kind of, you know, merged in a way, you know. Mm. It's... uh, at least, at the very least, agreed to be willing to cooperate with one another, but they because they have common interests, you know, right, and common membership in more deeper, more secret societies that go on behind even what we, the facade of churches and so forth, and Masonic clubs stuff. Behind that, there's another level or two of just plain old uh, what I call darkness, but plain old hidden. You know, secret substrata societies that actually are the the real thing. You know, the other societies exist, in, like Masonics and so forth, mm. uh, exist and do have, wield a certain amount of power, but only because the level beneath it gives it to them. Yeah, they're the, the know, they're the front group, they're the facade. For they're the, the ones that are there take the heat. You know, yeah, yeah, right. You know what little there might be, because usually they get away with it. You know, sure. Recently, you know. So, you know, uh, after reading your book, I was doing a little research on Utah, and it was fascinating to me that some of the oldest fossil remains, human fossil remains on the earth, were dug up in Utah not that yeah. long ago. Uh, yeah, I think you sent me that. I like, did. I just read about that, yeah, 15 million years old in Moab. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I've seen that area. Now, in visionary terms, I've seen that area when it was. Uh, more or less tropical. It's a, it was a beautiful place. It was, still is. I can uh-huh. see both when I go out and travel through that country. I can see the ancient tropics and as well as the beauty of the red rocks that are there now. Right. And that's where the Great Salt Lake came from. It was uh, part of an uh, in, an inland sea. Yeah, Lake that, Bonneville, yeah. Yeah, but, but you know, okay, so those those oceans that they extended over to that area, you know, the Native American say they call it Turtle Island for a reason because it rose up out of the ocean over yeah. a period of time. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, things have changed a lot over the years. But one of the things I found fascinating, too, was that the um, where the Mormons have put their geneal- genealogical records underground. Up in the mountain there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Wasatch, is it? Wasatch, yeah. Yeah, up there. And, and they, they buried it so deep, it made me wonder... 
So I did a little more research, and some people say that, that deep, 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 deep down in there, if you have the correct clearance, you'll see that there's actually alien, uh, you know, reptilian greys, aliens hanging out in in well, that facility. I have heard similar stories, but in, you know, and in my childhood, I have memories of, of seeing them in the more secret places around mm-hmm. Salt Lake mm-hmm. City. So that's all I can tell you. I mean, you know, I can draw in myself a direct correlation to those activities and to those beings. Yeah, hell yeah. And let me tell you, in, in my humble opinion, they're in, in on just about every, but there are, on just about every organization that exercises any power in this earth, mm-hmm. there is that association at some way, at some level, and that element of control, too, that goes with it. But, you know, some organizations are much more of an operational front for them. And unfortunately, the Mormon Church has been one of them because they really practice some some uh, real unique mind control and they've done a lot of he- uh, human experimentation. Mm. You know, this was the other side of the government's plan, you know, mm. and the merging that I talked about uh, because then the government had an isolated population Right. Upon which to practice brainwashing. Well, and other types of psychological experimentation in a mass scale. Right. You know, they were developing, you know, programs for humans back then, and the dark side of what we would call government. It's not really even government, it's more like industry in disguise, because it's the, the hidden industry, which is the farming of the human animal. Right, right, by the dark side. Yeah, they call yeah. it the guys I interviewed for my first book, uh, Close Encounters on Capitol Hill. A couple of the retired military were very uh, uh, officers were very adamant with me that it's not our government that's doing these things; it's the shadow government. Yeah, that is yeah. doing this. That which is it's a nefarious term. So hold on just a minute. We're going to take a quick break. Uh, Coyote, right. we'll be right back. All right. If UFOs are real, why don't they just land on the White House lawn? According to author Robert Stanley, UFOs did land on Capitol Hill in July 2002, but this is not the first time. In his new book, Close Encounters on Capitol Hill, Robert Stanley documents 224 eyewitness accounts of UFO sightings in D.C. from 1850 to 2006. This book also includes interviews with a dozen UFO experts. According to Robert Stanley, Washington, D.C. has the highest number of UFO sightings per square mile than anywhere else on Earth. How could this be possible, and what does it mean? Why has this fact been ignored by the media? It's high time for you to know the truth about the ongoing alien incursions of restricted airspace in Washington, D.C. Close Encounters on Capitol Hill is 408 pages of the most well-researched information ever written on the subject of UFOs and ETs. This controversial book is only available at unicusmagazines.com. That's spelled U-N-I-C-U-S magazine.com. Order your copy today. Here's what Bob Dean has to say about Close Encounters on Capitol Hill. Hello, Robert. This is Bob Dean calling. I found that I was a little negligent in not getting back to you and thanking you so much for the book. I also wanted to tell you how excellent it is. I enjoyed it thoroughly. And uh, I'm proud of you, my boy. You did well. Anyhow, I just wanted to say hello and uh, congratulations on the book and thank you for sending it and uh, how much I enjoyed it. Take care of yourself. Bye-bye. <laughs> little self-promotional uh, piece I put together there. Um Washington D.C. is really a very unusual place. I'm sure you you know that, even if you haven't been there. You know, I need to update that. Actually, uh, the the book is both of my books, Close Encounters on Capitol Hill and Covert Encounters in Washington D.C. are both available at Amazon.com. If anybody's interested in the hidden the hidden history of Washington D.C., oh, it's yeah. it, it's similar to you know what you've written. Uh, you know, uh, in the, the atomic bomb, what you've written about the Mormon church and the, the lifestyle and the power structure going on there, it's, it's a hidden history that most people never, ever consider um, till they read a book like yours. And um, so well, most the, people that read it, they'll, they'll find themselves having some visionary experiences, too. It's not just sure. 
in, on an, in another way, I mean, like you said, it's a microcosmic history of humanity. Yep. Besides being kind of an expose of certain aspects of life that mm-hmm. most people ignore, but you're coming conscious of them. And this book, for all of its, uh, oh, what would you call it? Anyway, for all of that, this book is designed in an energetic way to help you accomplish that. So it will, it will, uh, as you read these stories with an open heart. And, you know, I've, quite frankly, many won't be able to. They'll be so judgmental. And it's written deliberately that way. You qualify mm-hmm. yourself, more or less, just by how you respond. But anyway, if you go through this with an open heart, you will find yourself coming to those levels. Yeah, I, I really found some. there's some touching moments in there, too, uh, uh, about the uh, good dude, old good dude, and his, his uh, I think his great-grandpa, and his relationship with the the Indians and also with multiple wives, you know. I mean, there were just so many really, um, I could visualize those events so clearly and they're so so much part of the human experience that most people just overlook, especially these days. We've been so distracted by, you know, bad news every day and uh, the stresses of life. We just don't, I think we lost, really lost uh, touch with our roots. Yeah, that's true. But, you know, no matter who you are, where you're at, how unconscious you think you may be, mm-hmm. uh, it's happening for you too. And sure. there's no there's no exception. You know, everybody gets this opportunity. Not everybody's going to respond to it well. But yeah. Most will. Most will. And those that don't, they just go a different way. But they still come to the same place. Nobody crosses the finish line till everybody does. Mm-hmm. But consciousness is here. Mm-hmm. And it's it is the awakening and this is this is why the darkness is making such a push and why they've turned up their satellites and a lot of people are going cuckoo and having really rough <laughs> times. Yeah. You know, it's because they're they they know the gig is up and they're trying to delay it as long as possible, trying to find a flaw in it so they can get out. Right. You know? Yeah. And uh they ain't going to do it. it. Ain't going to happen, you know. But this is the reason for so much tension in the air. Mm-hmm. And I just want everybody to know that we're all going through this together. And I know it's dark and hard times for a lot of you, myself included. Yeah. Yep. But it's beautiful, and maybe we're equipped for it. And we will ride out this storm. Just remember, we're the surfer, surfer girls <laughs> on top of the baddest ass wave you ever saw, and we're riding it out, baby. And we ain't coming off that board, you know. <laughs> We doing it, you know. Well, Coyote, have you have you ever ridden a wave? On oh, a I body surfed. I body surfed a little bit when I was a kid. No, I've never even ridden a board myself. No. Yeah, it, it's really hard to do. I grew up at the ocean there in Malibu, and um, a lot of my friends were really good at it. I was just mediocre. But there were times in my life when I was absolutely dedicated. I, I mean, I was ready to actually die out there. Trying yeah, to, yeah. to I ride. Got friends like that, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's not funny because there were times, especially up in um, Central California, Big Sur. I stupidly went out there one time into some huge surf, and I I mean, I was just moments away from from drowning to death, and and it was the stupidest thing for me ever to have done that. Uh, yeah. Looking back on it, but yeah. you know when you're in the clutches of uh, when you're being uh, schooled by a force that is greater than yourself, uh, it's very humbling. And, you know, it's it's a tough lesson, but I don't think I would ever do that again. But uh, I was grateful afterwards, you know, uh, to be laying there. And it, I, I never forget this. I, I pulled myself out, finally pulled myself, just, just barely before I really drowned. I pulled myself up onto the sand, and there was hundreds of seagulls there, and you know how they make that kind of yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I, I could have sworn they were all laughing their asses off at me. You know, like, <laughs> you know, what did you think look was going to happen? Look at this silly human, you know, yep, shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. In fact, there was, you know, come to think of it, there was a a, a hobo or bum, the guy that was uh, sleeping uh, on the, the, I don't know if he was on the beach or up on the cliff, but he saw us coming down there. He was, I mean, he, he he's looking at me like, you are freaking crazy, buddy. You are yeah. out of your mind. You're not going out there. Yeah. Uh, and I wish to God I hadn't because it almost, it almost took my life. 
Um, well, yeah, but you learn and you grew, like you say, and so it was a good experience. I had a buddy that was surfing off of Santa Barbara and yeah. had a hammerhead shark chop the board in two right beneath him, but didn't touch him. Let him wow. go. Wow. Can you yeah. imagine? He well, went and got he went and got a hammerhead tattooed on his calf and his right <laughs> leg after that. You know that was his response. Thank you, thank you, universe. <laughs> Not so, yeah, that's one of the other great dangers of surfing is getting eaten by a, or or you know maimed by a shark. And and ah. where I where I was up there in Northern California, uh, Central Northern, whatever. It, there's a lot of shark attacks in that water, and um, you know so there was a reason there was nobody out, just 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 me and God. And uh, believe me, I was oh God, I was I was praying to God at that point. <laughs> just let me live through this. I'll never do this again. This was really not a good idea. Um, oh, yeah. So um, yeah, you got to respect. You got to boy, you got to respect the the ocean or the cosmos. The, the the there are so many forces greater than us, and yet, like you're saying too, I, I have trick. to admit, it's a trick. It's a trick. We we've we've been taught to be powerless. I think part yeah. of the reason why persons that are searching have so many brushes with death mm. is because uh, they're trying to help us remember that we have this power, uh, that we are creator as well as creation. Right. We're 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 a little of both, and so if we can open and be honest with ourselves in some way change the magnetic center of self so that you flow you know between the worlds guess what we just created the worlds you know i mean it's again that's that consciousness thing right 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 but, but i think that's why we have those experiences because you know it's part of our awakening well it's part of the lesson plan too i think of yeah. it this way that we're in a classroom and the reason we anybody goes to class is so you can better prepare yourself for the real world. So when you go out there, you have some skill, or at least some you're a bit more a little bit better prepared. Because season, season, yeah, 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 a little bit. Yeah, I mean, okay. Yeah. So because I think what you're describing is that once we graduate from here, we will go on as little gods to create other universes or cosmoses uh, from our own. Our own energy, our own consciousness will go out and actually create things that right now almost seem impossible based on the, you know, the classroom here. Well, actually, we're creating what we're living in. We really are. Mm. I mean, That's it's true, a, too. It's a mutual effort. We're already yes. doing it. Right. It's just becoming conscious of that. And then you have a whole different look at creation and what it really is and what it means. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, it's just experience. We love it. Yeah, you know, sure. Because we're in a way, we're still those cosmic little star beings. Remember that book you just sent me? Oh, that was so yeah. good. It matched, it matched so many of my old visions that I've sure. seen. Yeah, the enlightenment. But, but the, the enlightenment. The, yeah, it's up yeah. on my website. I, you know, that's that's I guess I should tell people in the audience. I don't make it too clear, but when you go to unicusmagazine. dot com, it's spelled U N I C U S magazine. dot com. At the top is a banner. It says Know Thyself. You know, we were just talking about that. The Mystery School. Okay, so if you click on the banner that says Know Thyself, you're going to get links up there that are um, uh, free information that is designed to help you know yourself better, including a book that we're discussing now, a, free, a very small book with a big message, and it's called The Enlightenment. And uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's a quick read, but it'll stick with you for the rest of your life and maybe beyond uh, this life. So I highly recommend that. Um, but That's got back, my endorsement too, brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I endorse that one too. That's good. Yeah, and you know, funny thing is, uh, Coyote, I don't know who sent that to me. I because huh. I, I got deluge with lately. I've been doing a lot of work uh, in the media and stuff, and and people, hundreds of people, have been contacting me from all the world, sending me emails. Well, somebody sent me that book. I don't remember who it was. So if you're listening to the show, thank you for sending that book, The Enlightenment. I put it out there for other people to read, and I hope they do that. Um, but getting back real quick to the whole surfing thing, um, it, it can be the most horrible experience in your life. You feel like you're dying, yep. or it can be the most wonderful experience in your life where you feel like you're literally uh, flying, and yep. and but on your own power. Uh, yeah, it's just not exactly yours. You're, what's happening is you're tapping into a cosmic force, yep. and and you're channeling that, and you're yep. one with that force. And when you really, uh, on the flip side, now I'm going to tell you a little story about when I was first getting into it. And down at my down at the beach where I grew up there at Malibu, Zuma. And the waves were really, really perfectly hollow that day. 
which makes it harder to, to work with them. But once you get in there, uh, there's something that, that we call the tube, and it's just it's just a it's just it's a way that the the energy kind of forms in this uh, vortex. Mm -hmm. So if you get inside the vortex and you go for a ride in the <laughs> in the tube, man, I mean it's it's like being born again. You're back in the womb, and then suddenly you're spit out in, into the world, and it's just the most exhilarating feeling. I, I mean, uh, I'll never forget that moment ever. Yeah. It was just so amazing to be buried inside the water like that as it's spinning around. And then the energy is just amazing because it there's this contraction, like an orgasm. It just contracts and it spits you out and you're standing there go, wow. Mama, it's mama, I love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, all you can do is hoot and holler because you just feel so, so glad to be alive after you've experienced something like that, it's, it becomes rather addictive, you know, in that regard. But uh, I'm sorry I got off on that little tangent, but I, <laughs> I'm glad, oh, no, I'm but glad you... No, but what you're describing is what many people experience when they're in their near-death moments, those close oh. moments, and they unite with the cosmic force to, mm. uh, in some way, circumvent the death that was planned right there. Mm, yeah, you did talk about that. You've talked about that, and, and I... I you know, I need to spend a little more time understanding that from you. Uh, I do. I did want to mention before I forget something. I'd like you to elaborate more about the avenging angels. I don't think many people understand that. Are that, oh, you talking about the Mormon avenging I'm, I'm angels? Back, yeah, I'm back to that yeah. again. Can you well, describe you know, a little? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. Can okay. you hear me? Well, the, yeah, just fine. There. Anyway, they they were like uh, in in the early days of the Mormon Church. There was a need for some kind of secret police because people take vows in the temples that back right. then were meant to be literal. Yeah, and literal. So they would pledge their lives if they ever, you know, fell away that you know a death sentence would be upon them, and and so the avenging angels became these these secret at first, you know, organizations to take care of that little problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, which made the church kind of like mafia. You know, I'm sorry, wow. but it did. You know, uh -huh. and 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 then it kind of evolved into taking care of people that were a problem. You know, but uh -huh. it didn't always work. Sometimes it backfired on them over there because you know they get the wrong person, they piss a lot of people off, and all of a sudden the whole country's against them. You know yeah. what I mean? Yes. They didn't. So they made a lot of mistakes, but they've refined it a bunch, and I understand that such an organization. When my uh, Grand, great grandparents first hit Utah. Uh, and the Avenging Angels were a force to be reckoned with there, you mm. know, and they weren't talked about too much because yeah. people just don't talk about that kind of stuff. It's so sure. dang secret. But they, you know, they would ride into town every now and then and take, it was sad as it is, take care of a family. And they they did some pretty gruesome stuff and even killed their cattle and livestock and burned them. Wow. And burned, burned the house, et cetera. It was very. Uh, and, it, and unfortunately, it wasn't uniformly applied, you know. But, well, of course not, because the human ego and the dark side was involved, and in, in, it yeah. seems like in matters of this this type. And it, but we're describing now Mormon on Mormon violence. Yeah, it yeah. was. Just, it was, you know, but it, it it really was kind of innocent in its beginnings. It was just yeah. meant to protect the, well, the of interest of the church. It was a business decision, you know, to sure. start with. But just like anything else. Uh, you know, it, it has good intentions, but it gets out of it, especially when things are secret. Oh, yes. Especially in, in dark ways like that, because you open the door to a lot of demons and a lot mm -hmm. of entities. You know, I, I don't have other words to describe them, or I'd use other <laughs> words, because I don't like the, the religiosity, and I don't like their terminology and how they use it. Yeah. So I try to avoid those words, but sometimes it's all you can find. <laughs> sure. Well, let's take a call, Grandpa. Here. Oh, awesome, yeah. Hey, Robert. How are you doing? It's Mark Snyder. Hey, Mark. Good to hear from you. I hadn't talked to you in a while, and I wasn't real familiar with your guest, and I just started listening to the show, and it it sounds like you guys are talking about angels and demons and the Mormon religion. Yes. Are you um, part of it? Yeah. <laughs> Is uh, can you elaborate a little more? Is there is it? It sounds like you were just starting to talk about um, Mormon on Mormon violence. Yes, he, we're talking about uh, Grandpa Coyote's book is called The Atomic Bum, B-U-M-B, and it's it's the uh, biography of a life of a 
a man who grew up in the Mormon uh, settlement in Utah and eventually escaped and is looking back on not only the Mormon church in a way that only somebody from the inside could see it, but also the origins of mankind and our relationship not only to a creator, but to some of these other uh, entities that we could consider demons and angels, I suppose. Well, don't, yeah. don't Mormons say that they, in their book, they talk about having contact with either angels or extraterrestrials. Don't they talk about that? And and I think they might even mention some other planet or something like that. Oh, more than one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mormons have Mormons. Uh, they got this planet Kola, but they think it's their origins. But, they, you know, yeah, their, their ultimate uh, theory for human beings in general is that we're here practicing to become gods and ultimately if you do all the right things and you pay all the right tithes and you know cross your t's and dot your i's that you know you get to be a god and go out there and and make your own little planets and you know procreate to your heart's content you know and and do it in the old-fashioned way with many wives that 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 was that's the that's paradise for them it's real similar to muslimism in a lot of ways you know they they have some common roots you know, between them, the Muslim religion and the Mormon religion. Hmm. Uh, the righteous Muslims can be a lot more stern than the Mormons, but sure. uh, they have some real commonalities between them. It's amazing. I mean, anybody that's been exposed to both of them should study the parallels and publish a book about it sometime. I mean, if we've got time for such things. It, it'd be <laughs> interesting because there are some real parallels there, you know. Did you know that that Billy Meyer, when he talks about the Palladians or Pleiarians, whatever you want to call, he uh-huh. he says he says that they are uh, polygamists and that they always have been. So it's possible that Joseph Smith actually was being influenced by uh, otherworldly entities, both good and bad. Uh, you know, who else does this? Uh, the raw alien movement. Uh, uh, there, I believe that they're into the polygamy thing as well. Yeah. Well, it goes beyond what we know of as polygamy. And, and, yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just give you a little scratch of surface here a tiny bit. Okay. Uh, Yeshua, who people call Jesus, you know, was this dude that went around, you know, at one stage in his career, uh, establishing these little communities of, quote, quote, true believers, as we would say now. Right. But, you know, these were folks that were so in love that could so experience one another, you know, that they were almost the same human being. Hmm. And and they got in these little colonies off the beaten path and, you know, practiced the self-sufficiency that goes beyond description. Nobody bossed anybody into anything. Hmm. Everybody just did everything that needed to be done. And everything just worked perfectly. There was the right number of people drawn to it, the right number of this, that, and the other, you know, uh, cobbler, baker, an Indian chief, you know, whatever. You know what I mean? It was all <laughs> there. But these people practice a divine love mm-hmm. that goes beyond description. It's more than sexual. It includes those elements. You know, right. a lot of the experiences in my book are builders to bring you to these, these states where you can actually open and conceive of such a thing that mm-hmm. goes beyond, you know, simple animal sexuality and right. the mystical aspects to that and takes it to a completely different realm. And if you remember right, when they when they go back to the beginning and they see the couple that are dreaming the dream, mm-hmm. there's no sexual apparati there. Right. It isn't necessary. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our unions are on a much different level in a much different way. Though... I kind of think the apparati goes along with it to a certain extent because there's something about us that doesn't want to let go of that aspect of the uh, toy nature and the toy dolls that we built for ourselves to live in. You know yeah, I mean? in in this matrix, the one we dreamed yeah. up, the one we created here, yeah, is different than that one where we we need to express ourselves energetically I mean, differently. Yeah, there's just something about this female and male thing. Mm. you know, that that goes beyond description, that is not what the love songs and, and all of the uh, <laughs> coupling books and the counseling books on coupling yeah. give you. It's something much deeper, much broader than this, and it doesn't stay at two. Mm. It multiplies itself. It draws, you know, 
its cosmic family to it, just like a magnet draws filing. Right, it, right. It, 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 when it, when people become conscious to that level, now those things are already happening on a different level right now. People of like natures are being drawn together in different areas of the world. Right. But this will take a new turn. As, as and I'm not sure what is going to flip the switch on that one, but it's it's already in motion. It's already happened. And you know, the angels were telling me today that critical mass is achieved, mm-hmm. which means that enough hearts are remembering themselves within persons that it's turned the balance in our favor a long time ago, really. But now the critical mass, enough in the person, you know, have received and opened. So mm-hmm. now the things we're talking about are not inconceivable any longer. They were just not that long ago. I mean, everybody would think, orgy, you're talking about orgies, you're talking about group sex. Oh, my God, you're a heathen! You know? mm-hmm. <laughs> or whatever, or people would be drawn to it, whatever. But for all the, the wrong reasons, you know what I mean? Right, right. Uh, but now such things really are conceivable. They, not that they weren't before, but people just weren't ready for them. Right. Like fruit ripening on the tree, it has to, you know, come in its own season, so... But yeah, it goes, man. And you know, I can only speak of this as a visionary. We're creating it as we go along. I can remember what's in the past. And I can see what's in the future. But that can change, just like the past can. Sure. (laughs) Right. And you're describing a tipping point, which usually comes after a lot of effort and focus and then when it yeah. when it happens it seems like whoa it happens it happens so quickly how'd that happen look in the night skies these days when it's clear and you can mm-hmm. see and you will get communication you will see stuff that you don't see there i mean i don't care who you are mm-hmm. they're there and they're waiting to say hello you hmm. know so do that. You know, they're brothers and sisters, you know. They're they're a part of us just like we are of them. Sure. But, you know, there are those amongst them that would be deceptive, but no longer is that to be. So So you mean you're but, talking about star people or extraterrestrials, right? Yeah. Yeah, some, but but you know, there's also the angelic realms that will become oh, more visible. And right. In fact, as the veil uh, dissolves, you will not believe what's truthfully in the sky. It's it's an amazing wow. thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I've only seen a tiny glimpse of it, but oh my God, when the universe opens, it opens. Man. And then you can yep. imagine it in multidimensional ways, which is still hard for our minds to conceive of. Mm-hmm. But imagine, imagine the busiest highway you know Without the rage, of course, and, and mm-hmm. with traffic being orderly, but just it's more than that. It's it's life exists in every little nook and cranny of what we know of as the universe and beyond it as well. Mm. I've been shown a place where the universe, our universe. Now imagine, I mean, we can't even participate in its vastness, mm. and it's a tiny bobble on a much much bigger tree. Many bobbles. You know what I mean? It's, oh, it's, it's infinite. Incredible. It's yeah, infinite. It's, it's, it's infinite. That's the, that's the thing that uh, this little book we were talking about, The Enlightenment, it helped me to understand, to move past the limitations of understanding that uh, cre- creation is infinite in the sense because a hologram, a fractal hologram, it just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding. It, it, it has an infinite number of di- uh, ways it can divide itself and still be whole. Yeah, yeah. And that was the beauty of it that that really helped me see beyond something that I guess we're all sort of conditioned here. You know, the, oh, you know, you can't understand infinity. You're not, you can't process that. Well, I don't have to. I just have to, like you said, my imagination can see it. I can yeah. see that very clearly now. It's it's yeah. not inconceivable to me at all. Yep. But it's uh, it's actually very um, empowering now. Uh, oh, I, I like those words in there. If you can experience it. Yes, it's and it has there. to be it's real. real. Yeah, yeah nothing's real. an illusion. It's all yeah. <laughs> because it's all consciousness. Yeah. We er, everything is has its own reality and its own um value within the the multiverses that exist. And the funny thing about the way he described in that book the enlightenment uh about um the game that's being played here, it reminded me very much of what you you know, your uh that you report in the atomic bomb about how we've sort of we took our original state of being and created a subset like a virtual yeah. like a video game almost yep. that we yep. we could participate in and then suddenly we found ourselves getting too caught up in it like yep. you know not just addicted to playing it we became the players 
Yeah. 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 Right? The toys became the players. Yeah. The yeah. Players. Oh, geez. Yeah. They got stuck and got stuck. Yeah. Temporarily, temporarily. Like I yeah. say, look at it, I look at it as a classroom. It's a learning experience. Yeah. Um, aren't you right? <laughs> <laughs> and, but but ima- imagine, you know, once we move beyond this, uh, how much stronger and smarter we'll be and more prepared to to go off and create uh, as as gods, little g gods. Yeah. Um, you know, our own universes full of other life forms, and uh, the games will go on. It just won't be quite like this one. Yeah. There would be no, well, there's no point to that. It's already no, been done. No, but, but I, again, I think, you know, what you're talking about is simply an expansion of what we're already doing. I mean, we've, we're already these creative parts of creation. Mm-hmm. Just by living in this dream, you know, right. it's proven to us our creative capabilities right now in this moment in time. Because, you know, we dreamt it up and lived it right this moment, you know. Well, I don't know if you and I have discussed this, but I've mentioned it before publicly, So, and I, I think I need to do this one more time, is that um, uh, there's a new science out there. It's relatively new to this world, but it's actually very ancient. It's part of the uh, fundamental understanding of who we are and what yeah. we are. Is that, that uh, con- It's called digital physics here and now, but it was dis- partially it was a discovery of a man who was, um, he was a physicist who was doing transcendental meditation and who had, had gone to these other, other levels of existence in his, out of his body, uh-huh. and he was, he was guided when he came back, he was he had this information that he needed to impart. Okay, so he did it in such a way that it was not only just uh, what we might term spiritual, it was also scientific. There was a blending there. And yeah. so it, it, it goes like this. I'll just summarize it, is that um, consciousness is primary and that it, it can take three-phase states, much like a drop of water that can be a solid, a liquid, or a gas, depending on its vibratory rate. Consciousness could be either... Pure consciousness, which is the highest vibratory rate, energy, which is a slightly lower vibratory rate, or matter, which is an even lower vibratory state. But it's all the same thing. It's all digits of the same thing. And they're they're all controlled by, ultimately, by the source of this, which is consciousness. Now, what was amazing about that book, The Enlightenment, which helped really put it all together for me, was that using what we perfectly now call the imagination is where we conceive. That is where the concept uh, uh, of the the beginning, the, the we construct it in the imagination. And if we hold that long enough, that vision, it becomes it becomes it emerges into the the uh, the matrix. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, it it becomes manifest because everything is consciousness. You have to think about it and hold that thought long enough for in for in order for it to manifest. And that's how we, that is when we receive the, you know, and once I understand that process, and I think everybody is going to get this, because this is not rocket scientists. This is actually pretty simple. It, it, it actually it sounds like, you know, actually sort of stuff you might learn in kindergarten, ABC, you know, one, two, three. We're uh, just babies, that's true. <laughs> but, but we have such a, we have, I've always known we have such a tremendous potential, uh, uh, you know, that's not being tapped into yet. But it will blossom at some point, like you said, you know, the fruit ripens and then, you know, it, it moves on from there. There's a whole cycle. It just keeps going and going and going. But uh, I, I'm very, very, very excited. And I think, you know, part of it is um, I, what I'd like you to describe is how the character in your book deals with the effectively with the dark side, these entities who who are there to... We're, we're, we're helping each other in a very strange way. It, does, it doesn't make a whole lot. It's not very clear because there's been a lot of lies and nonsense going on, uh, bruised egos and whatnot. But how how do you see our relationship being resolved with, uh, you know, the reptilians and the, the other entities from the dark side? Well, first we have to take a different look at it, a different perspective. Now, we know darkness is life. It has movement, it has thought, it creates energy, mm-hmm. it can affect and influence you pretty powerfully at times, and sometimes all the time, depends on who you are. Right. So first off, you'd recognize this is life. Secondly, there's a change in perspective. You know, you start with 
with uh, respect in life as you see it, no matter what form it takes. Mm -hmm. If you can't manage that, well, just try to look at it as life. But respect is real critical. It's key. But you've got to understand there there is another level to this. We're the rescue crew. Mm. We are soul brothers with these things we call reptilians, demons, and darkness. Mm. These are, uh, are like our alter egos. They're mm -hmm. like... Uh, they're like we're like one way they're like the other but they we are the same we're the same family we're even of the same essential spirit and hmm. so forth you know right so because of our closeness with connection with this that is so hates us and so wants to control and obliterate us and so forth mm -hmm. uh, that's really out of its mind in a way you know, you understand that we have come to help them remember and and let go of this this foolish darkness and these foolish ways, hmm. and remember and be in the heart once again, and then we, as children, go back to the playground and get to have fun instead of all this serious heavy bullshit <laughs> that we're going through now. Right. You know? So that's essentially the formula and the way, and the way we do this is by continuing our inner journey, and when we deal with the darkness, and baby, I tell you, I have as difficult a time with it as anybody does. Sure. You know, even still, I mean, mm -hmm. some good levels, but you always come back to the primary basics, and, you know, you just keep... You know, awakening, being this love, you just you focus inside, you you feel the energy in the palms of your hand, your hands in the middle of your forehead, and you just become aware and awakened, and you let the the busyness in the mind, you just kind of let it flow by, settle down, and little by little you become, you know, and sometimes not little, sometimes it's huge leaps, mm -hmm. but you get you get the light inside, the love, you begin to feel and experience and know it, and as you do. So does this darkness that's within you, this ego, whatever you want to call it, and whatever other entities have attached to you as well, because sometimes there's a lot more than one. But okay. it just depends on who you are and where you're at and how much you've agreed to carry before you came here. <laughs> but, you know, out of this inner search, you know, and by you know, little by little we become less and less responsive to that that other way. Mm -hmm. And ultimately we do see come to that moment where we see this as ourselves. We remember the moment when life walked out of the ocean side by side and we weren't divided. We were reptile and human too, you know, we were like mm -hmm. even though there was two apparently separate beings, we were born of the same mother, the ocean and right. the earth. You know Yeah, we have the same father we were, too. Right? Yeah. I mean, we were all created but by even the same. beyond that, even before that Mm -hmm. We're all these essential angels, mm -hmm. you know, that are guardians of many planetary uh, uh, systems that are keepers of the gateways and, and 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 keepers of the heart, the conscious experience of all. I mean, some of us are archivists. I mean, we're just, we're incredible and amazing, special. So every human that is alive now, mm -hmm. all seven and a half, eight billion of us, whatever there is, Mm -hmm. is an essential part of creation and creator. You know, we're like the cells that make up the body that is creator, you know, it, which is mother, which is what gives birth and life, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That we're changing the way we're doing things. So, you know, even this these cycles of birth and death are going away, you know. Our consciousness rises to such a state that we're no longer living in stages of separation. All life is love. Mm. And it returns to that harmonious state, you know, where it's always been. And nothing's hurting anybody, and nobody's suffering agonies. These are something we've invented, but we're letting them go now. But that's essentially how we deal with that darkness. Now, in the world, same mm. way. You send these people in these positions of power that are committing such heinous acts or, mm -hmm. you know, and working against us right and left, send them some of this energy you feel as you're in these enlightened ways. Group together in small groups and share energy and join in little circles and join your energy and project it to these souls. You know, uh, 
all across the earth in positions of, you know, financial and governmental authority and the shadow figures beyond them and so forth. In this way, we liberate and we set them free. We provide that opportunity. They can't help it. Guess what? If you've been dead, the living dead, and you've been operated through forever in a day, and you didn't even know you had a conscious heart, let alone a soul presence or a being person inside, all of a sudden that starts becoming apparent to you. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a change of ways, a change of heart. Right. And in this way, we don't have to punish any criminals, take them to trial or so forth. They purify themselves right along with the rest of us because they only rep- represent elements that are inside each of us anyway. They're the culmination of those elements. So this is how we we reform the darkness inside and the darkness outside in the same way. You know, just refuse to be unloving. You can be angry and still be loving. You can be in any state of conscious being or emotion mm-hmm. and still be loving. And, you know, this is when the gateways begin to open. Mm. And we begin to see and this is where we're this is where we're really at. The anxiety, the tension we're going through right now, isn't just letting go of the past, you know, of, of the of the, what we've known, you know, because it's like it somehow feels fixed to us, mm-hmm. and, and there's a part that just doesn't want to let it go. There's a sentimentality involved. <laughs> I think there's a certain degree of fear of of what comes after this because they're not real. So visualize it. Let, let us create it together. Let's right. practice these these communions, you know, mm-hmm. uh, with one another first. You know, let let's go to these places together. We don't have to be gathered in person right. for that to happen. Just put your consciousness out there, and and, and you know, uh, envision the world as you would ha- as your heart would have it, and that vision will be joined by a whole bunch of others. And this is the way we create it. Mm-hmm. And it don't matter how many restrictions you have, or how unconscious you are, or how alive you know you may feel. You, everybody adds to this present. This is the presence adds to us. Right. And this is how we change it. <laughs> hmm. yeah. It's not. It's not by. I mean, outer activity can be reflective of that, and I think we yeah. should, at one point, take to the streets, but only out of joy. Right. You know. Yeah. yeah. Protesting in anger doesn't really resolve anything. It just makes it other. It, it really turns a lot you of people have, off. There's some things you do have to protest. Oh, of course you do. Of course you, know, you do. Just like you would inside yourself. You know what I mean? Right. So there's some. There is a place for that. I loved yeah. it in the '70s. Of course, I was a little more radical then. But, yeah, you know, but there was also a feeling of, of uh, brotherhood and peace. I mean, what I'm seeing now with these these Occupy Wall Street movements is that it wasn't a grassroots thing, that it was very much orchestrated, and that uh, there isn't really any um, uh, alternative solutions. It's just a lot of negative energy just saying, you know, this sucks. Uh, uh, and, and that's, that's it's not... It's got to be ventilated somewhere. That doesn't mean it's bad. Just It's got to be ventilated, and, and, the, and the authorities should have stood by and let them do it, as long as they weren't. You know, and well, quit but there's stupid plants in there to, to make violence. Just you know, you they should have just happened? let them do it. Well, yeah, but I mean, some of those guys, like you say, they were agent provocateurs that were going in there and, and messing it up. There was rapes and a lot of people just being ridiculous. You know, like uh, defecating on cop cars and it is just stupid stuff. I mean, it it it, it kind of messes the whole thing up. Well, yeah, but there's always the idiots. I mean, you know, somebody we were talking about the Rainbow Children today. Uh-huh. You know, and, and the Rainbow Family, which is, you know, quite a, a unique organization and has carried forth some pretty good energy for a number of years. But, you know, the comment was, well, if you got the rainbows, you got to take the rainbows, too. <laughs> you know, because there are the downers, you know, and it yep. goes with any movement. But I understand yep. these people are in desperate need of some intelligent and creative love being manifest for themselves. Else they wouldn't be acting out in this way, no matter how much money somebody paid them to do it. That's or true. Or how crazy they are. Either way, because, I mean, to me, one's as crazy as the other. You get paid to yeah. do it, you're nuts. If you do it and without being paid, you're even nuttier. <laughs> <laughs> you know? What's the point? It doesn't make any sense. You know yeah, I mean? yeah, I mean, look, I'm just saying, for me, it, there's no attraction there. I, what I was doing was... Um, I initiated something called the Soul Light Project, which is very much what you're talking about. And uh, I did it, I, I offered it up uh, for days, uh, like the end of the Mayan calendar, allegedly. Yeah. And, 
August 28th, and, and also again on November 11th. Uh, I was giving people guided visualizations on ways that they could project their soul light to yeah. to aid the uh, evolution of our species and the planet that, uh, planetary system of Sun, Earth, Moon. And, you know, actually that wasn't my idea, Coyote. That was something I asked of uh, uh, my father, who I, I guess he lives in, He's just in a light, okay? I don't know exactly where it is, okay? Some people call it heaven, I guess. But anyway, the the guy that I, I told you about, uh, the radiant being, I, I asked him, you know, what can we do to help ourselves? And he says, well, you know, work together like this. And it seemed pretty straightforward, so I put it out there. And But I also I also knew that, that those those were only two events uh, this year that we could participate in. And uh, it was really very powerful. The first time I did it, uh, I don't know, really, I, I haven't heard back from enough people yet to know if we were, how effective it was. I know for me personally, the first uh, time uh, I did it, I woke up before dawn and I was waiting for the sun and to rise and I started my visualization of sending light to Washington, D.C. and and Rome yeah. and, 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 and London. And I was like, something inside me just it was, I had a, an awareness like, oh, my father is a radiant being, so I must be a son of light. And as I had that thought, it, it just like my whole body could be sort of like just switched like a flame on, just poof, like that, you know, and I was engulfed in this energy for a few seconds and it really kind of freaked me out because I wasn't expecting that, you know, and, and yeah. I'm not in a bad way, but it was, and it was really touching too because I suddenly had a realization of who I, who I am and what I'm doing here and it, it was, it was profound and, and uh, I, I just hope more, I, I wasn't the only one that had that awareness that day. But um, uh, so I guess I'm just trying to say I, I agree with what you're saying, and I think next year is going to be probably a lot of the tipping point. A lot of people have been anticipating not that there will be destruction of the earth, but simply the old way of life uh, will, will come to a close and a new way of life will begin. Remember what happened to the dinosaurs. They got stuck in the mud. <laughs> you know, they got too big and too brutal and fought too much amongst themselves and pretty yeah. much did themselves in. You know, that's essentially what the darkness is replicating now. They've become yeah. the dinosaur that's about to topple, really. it's gonna, Just don't be underneath it when it falls. <laughs> well, and the other thing is, I mean, I don't want to just directly combat them because we've been doing that for too long. I think what you're saying is is, is the, a more accurate way to deal with it. And I've also found that, uh, I've been saying to people, is um, whenever you feel yourself having a dark emotion, whatever it may be, uh, do not allow you are actually in control of that and once you realize that every time you have a, one of us has a negative emotion in ourselves it's actually feeding those that are that are still stuck on the dark side yeah. so if you if you really want to help us all evolve you yeah. got to start you, you can only work on yourself internally to control those emotions is key to uh, uh, helping not only yourself but helping all our brothers and sisters that are on the that are in the dark right now to eventually, as a matter of survival, they're going to have to come out of the dark. Stop living in the dark and feeding off of dark energy. They're going to have to come back out to the light and plug themselves back in to the source. Yeah. Well, this feeding thing, you just touched on a key thing there. Go ahead. It's realizing that you don't need to feed. Mm. You know, that you really don't. That There's no need or necessity. You are a living energy of love. You're creative and expansive. You, you don't need to feed. But see... First, you have to get them to question the emptiness. Now, how do you do that? Mm -hmm. By living that emptiness inside of yourself, going through it, mm -hmm. and making it a righteous part of yourself, mm -hmm. so that so that it can experience itself as fullness, not emptiness. Right. <laughs> it, it, it's always coyote medicine. It's always <laughs> like that. It's like this damn rhyme that doesn't just doesn't quite riddle out right. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Yeah. It's always a little tricky. But I know the elements, the ultimate elements of life. The thing that helps the entire earth change and in a heartbeat is simple as I'll get out. And when mm -hmm. everybody gets it, mm -hmm. we're all going to get it one morning. I tell you, I've seen this. Mm. One morning, you know, as they say, the, 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 you know, the, the, the apple falls, you know, you, you, you go, oh, it really is that simple. Mm -hmm. And there we are. You know what I mean? Hmm. And we'll all have this thought together when it happens. You're describing what Rupert Sheldrake talked about is the 100 monkey theory. 
That happened August 28th, 19-something uh, or another, 1994, I think it was, yeah. Uh, the August 28th is a real special day. It's the day of the 100th heart. Oh. That that's the hundredth monkey of the story you were just telling. That that's yeah. the hundredth monkey when the hundredth heart opened up in a singular generation of time. Yeah. Then the ascension was pretty much assured, and then it's just a matter of going through the motions. So wow. August twenty eighth. I mean, if you got to put importance to dates, and I try okay. not to, but, but okay. that one's significant. It really is, and and. Uh, it should be the day of the, you know, of the the feast of the hundred hearts, you know. Okay. Uh, celebrate, baby, you know, because that's when, and that's when, that's why that day, because there's an energy reverberating forward from that. That's yes. why that day can be so touching in the nowadays, and sometimes it, it truthfully is an energetic turning point for a lot of people, because that energy just keeps expanding through life. Mm-hmm. Exponentially, know? yeah, they call them morphogenic. Field. It's a resonant energy or consciousness. Yeah. That, that, that it's sort of like a ripple in a pond, and, and it actually accelerates as it moves out. And yeah, and so, then it multiplies and comes back. <laughs> yeah, it can if it's right. If it's in a, in confined, a sense. Yes, if it's in a combined area. That's right. They start to actually amplify each other. So so you're saying the seeds to ascension have already been planted, the seeds of consciousness. Oh, the, ascension, the, the ascension itself has already been accomplished Wow. in, in the past. So now we're just in the process of conscious, conscious realization of that, which you know pretty much finishes the process. Um, well, uh, like any seed, though, it has to go to fruition and uh, ultimately bear fruit, and that's what you're saying is that we're coming yeah, up is, on that this harvest. Is the harvest. This yeah, is that's the harvest. amazing. Yeah. Wow. This is the graduation. You know, some you call it a school. Well, guess what? Time to get your little diploma. Go on and live, <laughs> live your real life. Now get out of the fairy tale world, you know. Academia is one thing, baby. Real life's another. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. 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 I mean, it's I, soft and cushy there, and you get to be kids for a while. You know what I mean? But guess what? Now graduation, baby, hey. No more pretend. Let's go play. Yeah. Let's have some good fun on the fields of life. You know. What yeah. I mean? Yeah. But yeah, it is. It it really it truthfully is. You know, if it if it wasn't, you and I wouldn't be having such conversations right now. There wouldn't even True. be a book called The Atomic Bomb or The Enlightenment or any of these other instruments that are so uh, vital, uh, vitally helping awaken others. You know what I mean? Yeah. I just found another one today. Um, so called by accident, maybe you call it a synchronicity. <laughs> called uh, it's t- appropriately titled "Know Thyself," and it's based yeah. on really ancient teachings uh, yeah. from India and other parts of the world. And uh, it's a compilation. And I mean, I I've only been able to just just peek inside there today, but uh-huh. it's it it fit perfectly in my special uh, university, uh, the Unicus University there. When you Go to the, the website and click on Know Thyself. Now, the first link is a book called Know Thyself. And if I uh, read that book, will you give me a mail order diploma? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, I'll send it to you interdimensionally. Um, yeah, no kidding. Yeah. <laughs> man. Um, you know, for me, look, I. I I don't know how much people care about my life particularly, but since we're having such an open discussion... Oh, hell, we love you, Robert. You thanks. Know, you, you, I you've, love got, you. you've got Myers all over this <laughs> earth, man. We, you know, There's a lot of folks really love Well, I remember it, when I first heard you on the radio a long time ago. Yeah. Well, maybe not that long ago, but it's quite yeah, it was, a while. It was on Coast to Coast. I, I just loved you, man. You know, there, you, you were a guy that could speak my language. Not many guys do, you know, or girls yeah. either, you know. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I identified with your heart and your consciousness right away. Thanks. Well, but it's, look, I always maintain it's not about me. I'm just here to help as best I can because uh, I love everybody and I want us all to do better and better and better. Um, but, you know, for me, uh, growing up, I didn't I didn't fit into, <laughs> oddly enough, uh, hard, to, hard to believe, right? I didn't fit into the, to the, uh, the, the mold. And um No so, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Unic ah. Yeah, I, I I had a unique path in that um uh I just school was not very interesting to me, but I loved to read. And yeah. I mean I was uh my mom actually taught me how to read music before I could read words, which was kinda of strange. Uh, but you know, that's what she did. She was a pianist and she taught music. Um so she started me off with you know, reading 
for some reason, music, and then books when I was a little older, and uh, I couldn't get enough of it. Oh, part of it was where I grew up there. I didn't get any, uh, we got no television reception, really. And even the radio, you could only hear it at night when the, you know, the atmosphere changed. Yeah. So, so I was I was spent a lot of my time uh, reading, and um, and then um, I, I had uh, my parents the way that it was. My dad actually quit being a minister after he got married, and started a family. So he was an artist, and he would travel around, uh, mostly around the Southwest area. So I got to see a lot of that. But then eventually we started traveling out on cruise ships around the world. Oh, wow. And he, my, my, both he and my mom were. Uh, she would play the piano. He would, he would paint uh, pictures for people, and also teach them how to paint. And and so that became like a whole nother level of education. Traveling out to, I mean, I've been to over 50 countries by the time I was, uh, even before I turned 19. So, wow. yeah, for there was about four years there in my life where I was constantly traveling. My friends had thought I died or moved away or something. <laughs> <laughs> Like, where'd you come from? Oh, I just was in Russia or something. You know, I was like, uh, oh, I've been to the Great Pyramids. No, I've been to the Parthenon. You know, I was like, they're they're just like, yeah, right. No, I said, yeah, I actually was there. So it it changed me. Wow. It, it was a really unique path for me to take. And obviously it was my own. It was my choice, I, yeah. I think, on a much higher level. But what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, I've had access to information that you can't get in the normal school setting. Yeah. So so even though I, I really might not have a, a degree, per se, from a university, a lot of yeah. people I talked to said, you know, where did you go to school, man? How how did you get so smart? And just go, hey, I just read. I just yeah. read, 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 and read. And then, you know, at some point you reflect on it and start analyzing all the different threads, you know, and putting it together in a way that makes sense to myself. And um, the, way I, the way I validate it is by bouncing it off of the rest of the world and seeing, you know, how, what the reaction that they have. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's an evolving process. I, I'm never, ever tired of learning new things. But uh, the agreement that I have with the universe or the creator of this universe is I can have access to any information that I could possibly ever want or need. But the catch is I have to then uh, turn around and share it with other people without censoring it. Or, or using it as you know to a, for any personal agenda. Um, so in other words, I have to keep it pure. And if I do that, so far it works perfectly. That you know all everything's wide open. It's like a, a cosmic library card. I can I can have access to anything. It doesn't mean I understand it all. I, I'm not saying I know it all. Far from it. I'm still like I said. I'm still learning. But you know, um, I, I I just I'm just kind of giving this out anecdotally to people. Um, it's fine to go to school, but but uh, information and learning never stops. It just doesn't. It's oh, part of no. who we are. It's part, because we are consciousness. We are consciousness. Yeah. That's the whole. That's the whole reason to know yeah. who we really are. In fact, what we see of is learning here quite often is is unlearning. Really, mm-hmm. it's, it's going away from your natural instincts and ex- accepting something in a rote way that you already know in your heart. You know that. that right. It kind of take, robs you of the magic in some ways, you know. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, look, in the parapsychological realm, it says that you cannot know God until you have a paranormal experience. Because, <laughs> because, and and in, yeah, on the flip side, the the psychological uh, field says none of that is real because we can't duplicate it in a, in a laboratory. <laughs> Therefore, it's not valid. <laughs> So, oh, they're, they're leaning. They're leaning this way a little more. I know. They're starting to. They're starting to validate such things. But boy, don't take it in a court and law inspector. No. Man. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Because, because actually, funny you should bring that up. I reported in my first book. And something else I learned is that the original title or name of a psychiatrist, not a psychologist, a psychiatrist who can legally prescribe drugs, is uh, is called an alienist. <laughs> And and an I want alien you know, nest, huh? an alienist, actually, you know, and it, it's because it's because of this phrase right here. It's because they can place a lean. So if you take the word alien and you break it up into a lean, lean. yeah, a lean, it means it means literally they can they can. Uh, it's a French thing. It, uh, a, to a la guerre. It means to to bind. They have the wow. legal authority to to lock you up. Yeah, isn't that you know? crazy? Yeah, well, literally it is because they are a lot well, of them are nuttier than the people they condemn. <laughs> yes, they are. That's right. Uh, but they, right, but that that whole thing is going to fall apart. But it, it's just a funny thing. Like a lot of people don't know this, but the alienists 
are the ones that tell us whether or not what we experience is, are, is real or valid. I mean, who, what, how did they become? How did they get exactly, to like yeah. that? Exactly. Who, who, who gave you authority to validate, authority to validate me? I mean, yeah. I may not even validate you, buddy. Get out of my sight. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's. Well, you know, hey, it's it's just part of the process we're going through here. I, I thought it's it's very interesting. Uh, the exchange of ideas and information we're having tonight, and you know, I think this is this has really been one of my better shows having you, uh, oh, I love you on. Man. You, you, you're a flatter boy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, te- I'm telling you from my heart, Coyote, that that I think you're right. You and I do speak the same language, and I I think we kind of intimidated. This is not many people called in tonight, but Mark, if you're out there, I appreciate you calling in, and uh, uh, I I just think um, you and I needed to have this conversation publicly because i i'm sure even though a lot of people didn't call in they were listening and um oh, with uh their heart with their hearts you can feel them. yeah you just feel them they're out there and there'll yeah. be many more that listen to it later too. that's exactly how it works that's right yeah so. okay well i'm going to give you the final word so we're getting winding up here only got a few minutes left well guys let me let old grandpa coyote tell you that i love you and you know the atomic bomb isn't a necessity in your life, but if you want to have a little fun sometime and, and help yourself along on the awakening journey, or just get a good laugh, you know, mm-hmm. but be ready. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> it's not just a laugh. <laughs> it's coyote mess, but the, the atomic bomb, it's a, it's, a, it's a cool experience. I think you'd like it. At least a lot of you would, and you can get a signed copy of it if you go to my website at, called thehealingwalk.org and uh, click on the link for the atomic bum, you know. And you won't get it in time for Christmas, forget that. But, yeah. you know, if you want to want to go that way, you know, um, hey, just give it a shot. But main thing is, you know, we love each other. Uh, uh, just try to be as open and prepared as you can be. I'm on YouTube. I've, uh, I've got a um, Peter Coyote, that's my channel there. And it's Coyote's always spelled with a K in my family. Uh, and I'm on Vimeo.com too, same way, slash Peter Coyote. I got a channel there too, so uh, got some real fun videos. Take a look at those too. There, there's no charge. I mean, it's all free. So <laughs> great. I don't all know right. what else can I add, Robert. I mean, you know, I love you, and I really appreciate the opportunity to be on your show. I feel honored, and I bless you, brother. And I thank you thank for you. all of your um, encouragement and, and connection here. Wonderful. Thanks again for coming on. I love you too, and uh, I'll keep in touch. Okay, please do, man. Take care. You too. Good night. Good night. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, another episode of the Unicus Radio Hour. Look forward to uh, seeing you next time. Till then, good night and God bless.